Hello and welcome to chapter 11. Here we're going to discuss galaxies. This is the first chapter where we start really talking about things on the galactic scale or even the scale of the entire universe. We've been getting progressively larger and larger in our scale. And so you'll see that we'll continue to talk about galaxies over the next couple of chapters, but we'll get more into talking about where they came from and of course the origin of everything, the Big Bang. Here we're going to start with our own galaxy and kind of build on similar ideas from there. Okay? All right. So here is a view of our galaxy, looking into it. The red represents the fact that we're looking in the infrared spectrum, largely in this picture, because a lot of the light in the visible spectrum is obscured. So we can't really see across the galaxy unless we look into light that isn't visible light, the colors of the rainbow. You know, we have to look at either higher energy light that's able to pass through the, the dusty band of the galaxy, or we have to look at long wavelength light that is able to not get scattered as it passes through the dusty galaxy. Okay, so what do we want to learn about the Milky Way? Well, we want to learn what does our galaxy look like, right? Where are we? What's its structure? And how do stars orbit the galaxy? Is it like how planets orbit the sun, you know, or how planets orbit other stars? Well, let's see. Okay, so what does our galaxy look like? Well, here is an all sky view. So looking at the band of light that represents looking into the disk of the Milky Way, <clears throat> including the center of the galaxy. All right, if we could see the galaxy from, you know, outside of it, of course we can't. It would take a, a huge amount of time to travel out of the galaxy, thousands of light years, even from our current location, about two thirds of the way out to the edge, it, we would be able to, we'd be able to see something like this. We'd see that the, the galaxy is about 10,000 light years in thickness, all right? But it's about, a hundred, about 1,000 light years in thickness, excuse me, but it's about 100 times longer, okay? So we see it's about 100,000 light years across. So it's much, it's, it's much thicker than it is wide, right? About 100 times thicker than it is wide. Um, it has a disc-like shape. It has a bulge in the middle. And our current location is about 20,000 light years from the middle. And of course, the radius is half of the diameter. So we're about 27 over 50 the way out, okay? There are also something called the halo which is a leftover origins of the galaxy and clusters of stars within that so-called halo, which are called globular clusters, okay? So this would be looking at the galaxy from the top. All right, so we would see a central bulge. Our galaxy is called a spiral galaxy and it is called a barred spiral galaxy because we see that this, the bulge makes a bar shape and we can ascertain the shape by kind of modeling the location of all the stars that we see from our current location, right? Because again, we can't actually see this, but we see other galaxies that have the, char the characteristic ship shape that we take our own galaxy to have, okay? Furthermore, when the stars move around the center of the galaxy, they don't move like a perfect disk. There is a kind of a, a wave-like motion, okay? So we can see here that halo stars, those are the ones that are not in the disk of the galaxy, they travel far above or below the galaxy and they go in ra basically random directions. And again, that's because they are, they're left over from the early formation of the protogalactic cloud that made the galaxy. The bulge has stars that also orbit in random orientations, okay? So it's basically a full three-dimensional motion. But the disk, most of the galaxy, has stars that have circular motion with a little bit of up and down, which is exaggerated here in the picture. And that up and down is the yellow, okay? Because there, there are forces that cause a gravitational movement up and down, okay? So stars in the disk all orbit in the same direction, right? So all the stars in the disk all go in this counterclockwise direction, okay? The orbit of stars in the bulge and the halo have random orientations, so they share that in common, but they don't share much in common. Otherwise, the stars in the bulge are much more similar in composition and age to the stars in the actual disk, okay? But, uh, but it is true that stars in the halo, such as the globular clusters, do move in random orientations. So why do orbits of the bulge stars bob up and down? Well, that's because the gravity of the disk stars pulls them towards the disk, all right? So the sun's orbital motion, the radius and velocity, tells us the mass within the sun's orbit. This is essentially using Kepler's third law, okay? So we've talked about before, so that's the name of the law. It's a relationship between period of orbit and radius of orbit, okay? And it allows us to calculate mass. When we do that mass calculation, we find that there's about 1.9 times 10 to the 41 kilograms, which would be 41 zeros as illustrated here, right? It's a lot of zeros. And that's a lot of kilograms. That's a huge amount of mass that's within the sun's orbit of the galaxy, okay? 
The relationship is shown here, all right? This is the relationship between the mass within the radius of the sun's orbit around the center of the galaxy. That radius, the velocity of the sun, which we can find from assuming a circular motion and finding the period that it takes the sun to travel around. And again, we would gather that data by looking at the motion of our star, our sun, relative to other stars, okay? And then G is the gravitational constant, okay? So our galaxy consists of a disk of stars and gas with a bulge of stars at the center of the disk, surrounded by a large spherical halo, okay? So it's a disk with a much lower density spherical halo. Stars in the disk orbit in circles going in the same direction with a little up and down motion, and the orbits of the halo and the bold stars have random orientations, okay? So let's talk about what happens within a galaxy in terms of the dust and the stars and the formation of stars from that dust. We call it recycling. And the idea there is because there's a process. Stars explode, okay, especially certain types of stars. And when they explode, they spread their matter out into the galaxy. Over time, those packets of denser matter interact with other clouds and maybe less dense matter. Eventually, they're able to cool if they're farther enough away from other stars. And then they can condense and collapse and eventually form new stars. That type of process, death of stars, spreading of matter, conventional condensing of matter, well, that's recycling because it's using the same matter over and over again. Dead stars becoming new stars, all right? So let's understand how gases recycle in our galaxy and how do stars tend to form in the galaxy, all right? So here we have the, ga the galactic recycling process. We're gonna describe some of the steps here in going from interstellar gas clouds back around to stars and eventually supernovas and so on, all right? So this is the star gas star cycle because we go from star to gas and back to star, hence the name star gas star cycle, okay? It recycles gas from old stars into new stars. All right, so let's start at this stage right here, okay? And let's go from there, talk about how we can then get back to where we started. So high mass stars have strong stellar winds that blow bubbles of hot gas, okay? So the idea is that these very hot stars are able to basically, they, they heat up gas, they create ionized gas, that ionized gas, um, emits energy and it moves around, it pushes, it pushes the gas, okay? Because that's important because that's going to cause condensation essentially. It's gonna cause areas of concentration in terms of density of gas. Lower mass stars return gas to the interstellar space through stellar winds and planetary nebula, all right? Our own star is gonna go through a planetary nebula phase. It's gonna lose about half its mass, even though it never blows up, it still will lose half its mass and that mass will get spread out in the space, okay? X-rays from hot gas in the supernova remnants reveal newly made heavy elements, all right? So this is, the, this is where we have heavy elements in addition to the elements that were made in, during fusion inside the cores of stars. We have the actual fusion of even heavier elements during the high energy explosion of supernovas, okay? A supernova remnant cools and begins to emit visible light as it expands, okay? Because at first, all of its emission is going to be in the X-rays because it is so hot. It's also going to be emitting um, radio waves from very fast-moving, um, basically, charged particles, but the actual more heat signature is going to be in the X-ray spectrum. New elements made by a supernova mix with the interstellar medium, as I said, right? So we have existing interstellar medium, largely atomic hydrogen, but this is where you constantly have these trace amounts of mixing heavy elements, especially from very, very high mass stars, because that's where the heaviest elements are made. And just side note here, the really heavy elements are actually made by even more extreme phenomena than like the collision of neutron stars, okay? All right, and we can get an idea here of some different common, excuse me, some different common wavelengths um, in the interstellar medium in terms of ionized oxygen, doubly ionized oxygen, lots of atomic hydrogen, and so on, right? These elements that exist, all right, in the interstellar clouds. Radio emissions in supernova remnants is from particles accelerated near the speed of light. And that's, that's what I mentioned is that there's these two very distinct signals that come from supernovas, X-rays because of the heat, and then radio waves because of the fast acceleration of charged particles, in particular, electrons. Many cosmic rays probably come from supernova as well, and they can come from other, other origins as well, such as, as something I mentioned just a moment ago, collisions of neutron stars. Multiple supernovas create huge hot bubbles that can blow out of the disk. So matter doesn't stay entirely within the galactic disk. There is, there's definitely exchange of matter in and out of the galaxy. And this is an example of that matter getting pushed up out of the galaxy, all right? And gas clouds cool in the halo can rain back down on the disk because eventually the gravitational pull will pull that matter back down, all right? 
Okay, so atomic hydrogen gas forms as hot gas clouds, hot gas cools, allowing the electrons to join with protons. Because when the gas is really hot, say when it's near a, you know, a, a star, even a main sequence star, you know, or not even a supernova, just a main sequence star, but a very, very hot one, one that's on, you know, on the, basically the, um, maybe an O type star, which are the hottest types of uh, main sequence stars. And main sequence stars are those that are turning hydrogen into helium through fusion in the cores. But this is a much larger, hotter star than our own sun, which is in the middle of the main sequence in terms of temperature. But point being is that the gas around a star like that is ionized because it's putting out so much heat. That's unlike the interstellar gas that's around our own sun. Around our own sun, we, we're actually in a pocket of very, very low density, but non-ionized gas because it's been able to cool. And when it cools, the electrons join with the protons, okay? So that's what we, that's what we refer to as atomic hydrogen, all right? Atomic hydrogen is interesting because it actually doesn't leave much of a signal. The one signal it creates is called the 21 centimeter line, which is from this very, very low energy phenomenon of, of the actual electron spins in these gas molecules getting turned upside down and that exchange of energy of the electron spin getting changed release, releases a particular microwave that has a wavelength of 21 centimeters, hence the term 21 centimeter line, referring to the spectroscopy of that line. But the point being that the atomic hydrogen eventually, since it is cool, can then start form, can start combining with these other, these other molecules, these heavier elements that are left over from supernova, and start to form molecules, rather fairly large molecules, based on, largely on carbon and oxygen. And additionally, these molecules then can, then can even clump together, forming tiny, tiny dust particles. And those dust particles will then allow for more molecules to form because they're absorbing some of the energy because the, the, the dust is able to, you know, to basically absorb energy and radiate it away as infrared and thus you know, not, not just tear apart molecules. So it's this process, this gradual process of, of a very, very energized gas eventually cooling and then combining, all right? So molecular clouds, this is an example of molecular clouds in the Orion const uh, constellation, mostly diatomic hydrogen, because after all, the universe is mostly hydrogen, um, about 28% helium. Again, helium is going to be the first thing that's produced by most stars, so that there's more, more abundance of helium than any other he heavy ele heavier element, of course, heavier than the base element of hydrogen. Then we have about 1% carbon, um, carbon monoxide, and then lots of other molecules as well. Carbon monoxide is an important part of the story, okay? So gravity forms stars out of the gas in the molecular clouds, completing the star gas star cycle. And I, I spoke before about the importance of carbon monoxide, and that's because really what it's doing is it's able, particularly well as a molecule, it's able to emit a good amount of light, and thus that light, thus the, the basically the thermal energy is then able to leave the cloud, thus allowing gravity to continue to collapse the cloud into higher and higher density, eventually turning it into a protostar that then starts fusion. Okay? And you need molecules like carbon monoxide to emit enough light to allow gravity to, ca to cause that collapse. Okay? All right, so there we have the completion of the star-gas star cycle. Okay? And it's all made possible because of the proximity of stars to each other within the galaxy. Okay? And just the movement of the dust as the dust gets pushed around by all these gravitational effects of 100 billion stars all swirling around in the disk that we showed a few slides back. Radiation from newly formed stars is eroding these star-forming clouds, right, and then leaving, leaving the formed stars within. Okay, so the summary of the galactic recycling, and there's a lot of steps, so we should kind of summarize them all. Stars make new elements by fusion. Dying stars expel the gas and new elements producing hot bubbles that have a temperature of about a million Kelvin. The hot gas cools, allowing atomic hydrogen clouds to form, which has a much lower temperature in the range of 100 to 10,000 Kelvin. Further cooling permits molecules to form, making molecular clouds, which are as cool as 30 Kelvin. And then gravity forms new stars and planets in the molecular clouds. All right, so where will the galaxy's gas be in a trillion years? And to give you some perspective here, a trillion years is about a thousand times, well, at least 500 times um, longer than the current age of the universe. Okay, so this is, this is an incredibly long time. So what do you think? All right. Well, most of it is going to be locked in white dwarfs and low mass stars because those incredibly long lived stars, which live for 30, 100, 150 billion years, well, they're, they're, they're going to be all that's left. Okay. And eventually the white dwarfs are basically going to radiate all, away all their energy and eventually just become, become crystalline black dwarfs, right? Which are not, not at all like, you know, like black holes. They're just cooled off white dwarfs. All right. 
So we observe the star gas cycle operating the Milky Way's disk by using many different wavelengths of light. It's so important to consider the, the galaxy in different wavelengths. Let's, let's kind of go through a few of those. All right, so this is looking at radio, the radio waves. So as I mentioned before, <clears throat> the 21 centimeter line is emitted by atomic hydrogen. So think 21 centimeter radio waves, which are a form of microwave, right? but rather long microwave, longer than the microwaves that are used in your oven, okay? which are about three to four centimeters. And then you know, associate that 21 centimeter line with atomic hydrogen. Okay? Then we can look at the galaxy in the visible spectrum. In the visible spectrum, there are large dark spots because every time there's a molecular cloud, it completely blocks out visible light. Hence all the dark, dark spots in the visible spectrum. Okay? All right, we can look in the radio spectrum. All right, radio waves are emitted from carbon monoxide. That's um, in a cooling molecular cloud. Okay, so that's going to be a, a basically a different a, and a longer wavelength than atomic hydrogen. Okay, um, it shows the location of those molecular clouds. All right, another another um, wavelength we can look at is infrared. All right, infrared is going to be um, much much shorter than twenty one centimeters. In infrared lines. Um, are going to be on, on really kind of nanometers, tens of nanometers, okay? Um, you know, they can be as long as micrometers. So long wavelength infrared emission shows where young stars are heating dust grains, all right? So this, is, this comes from very cool, you know, that, that's like the, you know, the 100, 100 degree Kelvin vibrations. That's, that's going to be emitting infrared light or even, even up to, you know, a, in the range of 200, 300 Kelvin is emitting infrared light, okay? Um, then we can also look uh, further in the infrared. Um, they build stars whose visible light is blocked by gas clouds. All right, so ba basically there, the only, the, only ga the only light that's getting through is the infrared. So you take a star, star like our sun, it emits a lot of light. You know, the peak intensity light is in the visible spectrum, but it is also emitting infrared. Well, the infrared will be able to pass through a cloud where the visible light would not. There are also X-rays. Right? X-rays are very high wave, very high energy, very short wave, like very different from the other types of light we've talked about so far. And this comes from those very hot gas clouds, those ones that are as hot as a million Kelvin. Low density, but very hot. All right. We also have gamma rays. Gamma rays are even higher energy, shorter wavelength than X-rays. And gamma rays show where cosmic rays from supernovas collide with atomic nuclei in gas clouds. And again, other sources of gamma rays include black holes and neutron stars. Okay. So where, where do stars tend to form in our galaxy? Like where would we find hot beds of star formation? All right. Well, let's consider. All right. So ionized nebula are found around short-lived high-mass stars signifying act active star formation. All right, so that's, that's going to be some of the conditions that lead to star formation. All right, Refle uh, reflection nebulae scatter the light from stars. Why do reflection nebulae look bluer than the nearby stars? Well, the same reason the sky looks blue. All right, it's scattered blue light. All right, the shorter wavelength visible light gets scattered, whereas the longer wavelength light, longer wavelength light is able to pass right through. So the effect is the cloud appears to glow blue, just like the sky appears to glow blue. It's because the scattered light, scattering just means the light's going off in all directions. All right. So if we look at the halo, remember the halo is that they kind of, as I refer to, the remnant of the original cloud that made the galaxy, the very, very large cloud that made the whole galaxy. Well, there is no ionization nebula, right? There are no blue stars at all. Right? There's actually only red stars in the nebula. On the other hand, the disk is full of ionization nebula and lots of blue stars. All right? So that's where the star formation is happening. There is no star formation in the halo. Those are all just leftover long-lived stars. Okay? Much of the star formation in the disk happens in the spiral arms. All right? So the area between the arms have much less, not none, but much less star formation. So we find most of the star formation along the arms themselves because the arms are where the matter is getting condensed, which makes star formation possible. All right? and I, just, I highlighted one arm, for example. Okay, and this is the Whirlpool Galaxy. Spiral arms are waves of star formation. All right, spiral arms are waves of star formation. Number one, gas clouds get squeezed as they move into spiral arms. As I mentioned, that's a concentration, higher density. The squeezing triggers star formation. Young stars flow out of the spiral arms. So interestingly, they don't, and not everything moves in unison. There's, yes, there's a general motion of the whole galaxy, but it's like a fluid. It's not every, in, not every star, because I mean, there's a hundred billion on them. They're almost behaving like individual molecules, if we use the fluid analogy, that not every star is moving together. They're kind of sloshing next to each other. Some move faster or slower than others. Okay, so in summary, how is gas recycling in our galaxy? Gas from dying, dying stars mixes new elements into the interstellar medium, which slows cooling, making the molecular clouds where stars form. All right, so it's necessary that you have to have cooler clouds. Stars cannot form from those very hot ionized clouds. Those stars will eventually return much of their matter to interstellar space when they die, either 
with a planetary nebula or more dramatically with a supernova. Active star forming regions contain molecular clouds, hot stars, and ionization nebula. Much of the star formation in our galaxy happens in the spiral arms. All right, so let's talk about the history of our home galaxy, the Milky Way. What, um, what do halo stars tell us about our, our history, our galaxy's history? I've hinted at, right? I said the remnants. And how did our galaxy form? All right, so let's see. So if we look at halo stars, we find out they have a very low amount of heavy elements. Heavy elements being basically anything heavier than hydrogen and helium. So those, the stars in the halo don't have very much um, oxygen, very little iron, and so on. On the other hand, stars in the disk have a full 2%, still not a lot, but 2% heavy elements. All right, and they have stars of all ages. They're not just old stars, okay? So there's a very different population between these two stars. Sometimes they're called population one and population two stars. Population two would be the ones in the halo. And that name refers to the uh, astronomer that kind of first noticed the difference between the two. So population two are the halo stars and population one are the stars in the disk. Don't think about them in order because population two stars are actually older. All right, that's just, you know, so the name is kind of misleading. It was just a way to group them, group them apart. The name is still around, even though it was coined in the 1940s, okay? All right, so halo stars formed first, and then they stopped, all right? And there was no formation left over, okay? All right, the disk stars formed later, and now they're continuing to form because that's star gas star cycle, all right? So how did our galaxy form? Well, there was some huge original disk called the protogalactic, or excuse me, cloud, called the protogalactic cloud, and it collapsed. It collapsed under gravitational forces, all right? So our galaxy formed from a cloud of intergalactic gas, so a huge, huge cloud, all right? And it basically was only hydrogen and helium because it was formed with the original building blocks after the Big Bang. The halo stars began to form as the protogalactic cloud collapsed, excuse me, as the protogalactic cloud collapsed, okay? And so the idea there is that there would have been pockets of higher density within that cloud. That allowed for immediate star formation, those are the halo stars. This was early, early on. Before there was any disk, before the disk was really rotating much, it was before the collapse, before the overall collapse. So those halo stars are formed, but most of the matter would have collapsed and started to rotate. As the, as the, cl as the cloud collapsed, it, it became more disc-shaped due to conservation of angular momentum, and it started to spin faster and faster as it became more concentrated. But the thing is that the halo stars, since they were much higher density, they weren't, they weren't able to collapse with the rest of the cloud, they were left behind, showing the original spherical shape of the cloud that formed our galaxy. So it's, real, it's, it's so interesting, we can kind of see the history of our galaxy in the outline of the halo stars. All right, so billions of years later, the star gas star cycle supports ongoing star formation within the disk, okay? Including, which includes the spiral arms, of course, but the halo stars are left out of that. They're just old stars that'll be around until they eventually all become white dwarfs, okay? All right, and a few neutron stars. Okay, so, right, stars continuously form in the disk as the galaxy grows older, all right? So detailed studies show that the halo stars formed in clumps that later merged. That's why we have the globular clusters, okay? So in summary, the halo stars are all old with a small proportion of heavy um, or smaller proportion of heavier elements than the disk stars, indicating that the halo formed first. Okay, so there's a good good evidence there. The halo stars formed early in the galaxy's history. The disk stars formed later after much of the galaxy's gas had settled into the spinning disk that we now know as our galaxy. All right. Okay. So now we've talked a good deal about our galaxy, understood some of its basic structure and kind of its function. Now let's compare it to other galaxies. All right, so our goals here are to talk about how are the lives of galaxies connected with the history of the universe and what patterns do we find among the properties of galaxies. All right, so here we see a bunch of individual galaxies taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. You can see the sky is full of them. You wouldn't see these with a naked eye or even a basic ground-based telescope, but you can see so many of these galaxies, right? Some of them spiral, some of them what are called elliptical. All right. So our deepest image of the universe shows a great variety of galaxies. This is remarkable. Some of them billions of light years away. This image here is taken from a single portion of the sky, which is equivalent to holding your hand at arm's length and considering a little point that is about this size on your thumbnail. And that is this image here. To just give you an idea how many galaxies there are, this is how many just fill that tiny proportion of the sky. All right, so galaxies age, this distance, and the age of the universe are all closely related. 
The study of galaxies is thus intimately connected with cosmology. Cosmology is the, the study or the, the, the term given to the study of the structure and evolution of the universe itself. Where did the universe come from? How did it start? Those are the kind of questions that are answered by cosmology and the people who study cosmology are called cosmologists. Okay. All right. So that's the thing is once we start talking about distant galaxies, we really are, start talking about the nature of the universe itself. Because when we look at galaxies, we're looking at galaxies that are so far away that we are looking billions of years back in time. Because if we look at a galaxy that is 2 billion light years away, we're seeing light from 2 billion years ago. Well, the universe is about 15 billion years old, so now we're starting to get up to you know, significant portions of the age of the universe. And we can see galaxies that are 10, 11, 12 billion years old because they are 10, 11, 12 billion light years away. Okay, now there are closest galaxies. The closest gal galaxy to us is 2 million light years. So a whole order, you know, a three orders of magnitude less than a billion because the difference between a billion and a million is a thousand. Okay. So what patterns do we find among all these galaxies? All right, well, let's consider that. Okay, so galaxies can be divided into three categories, spiral, elliptical, and irregular. Okay. All right, so spiral galaxies are just that. They're spiral galaxies like our own. They have bands, all right? They're, they're collapsed into disks, all right? So they're, you know, they're wide across, very narrow up from the side. They all have that in common. We live in a spiral galaxy. The Milky Way is a spiral galaxy, all right? So they have a central bulge, all right? They have a halo, okay? All right, some are barred, right? Our, our spiral galaxy is moderately barred, not as dramatic as this example here, all right? So why does ongoing star formation lead to a blue-white appearance? Well, because of the short-lived stars, right? So because there are stars that just live 20,000, 40,000, 100,000 years. And those incredibly short-lived stars are the ones that burn really hot and they burn blue. That's why we see blue, for example, within the arms, the spirals of spiral galaxies. All right? All right? Lenticular galaxy has a disk like a spiral galaxy, but much less dusty gas. It's an intermediate between a spiral and an elliptical, all right? All right, but now on to an elliptical, kind of a proper, because so and you might think, oh, is this, is this the fourth kind? Yeah, but don't worry about it too much. We care about the three main types. So now on to the second main type after spiral galaxy, an elliptical galaxy, all right? Well, they're all spheroidal, which is to say they're sort of, you know, they're, they're shaped like squished spheres. Um, they virtually have no disk component, okay? And they have a red-yellow col red -yellow color indicating older star for, um, populations. So one theory about elliptical galaxies is they actually are largely formed from the collision of spiral galaxies because spiral galaxies can be quite close to each other. Maybe a, you know, just one spiral um, galaxy diameter apart is another one, so they tend to collide quite frequently. And sometimes when they collide, they completely lose their structure. They lose a huge amount of the energy that, main, that maintained their spiral shape. And what's left behind is just a spherical, um, huge cloud of stars which then becomes an elliptical galaxy. And since thus by their very nature, being, you know, having formed from the collision of spiral galaxies, they tend to be much older. Also, they don't, they don't facilitate as much star formation, so only the old stars are left, which is then why elliptical galaxies tend to be redder, okay? And they have that red-yellow color. Okay, because again, you can think of red-yellow color as indicating a mostly old star population. All right, last, there are irregular galaxies. All right, they have a blue-white color indicating ongoing star formation, but they don't have a spiral shape or really an elliptical shape. They just kind of have odd shapes, okay? So what do we think, right? Well, we think that what's, what's been going on is we had, you know, kind of rounder appearances. Maybe we have older galaxies are spherical, but we also have the idea that, that you know, that galaxies are also going to be formed from maybe shorter-lived spiral galaxies. And the newest galaxies that are maybe the youngest ones that we see around us are ones that are formed that were formed more recently, and those are going to be spiral galaxies. All right. So spiral galaxies are often found in groups, right? Very much so. All right, of up to a dozen, sometimes even larger, maybe a hundred. All right. Elliptical galaxies are much more common in huge clusters of galaxies, hundreds of thousands together. All right. So it's actually quite quite fascinating when we you know we see these kind of smaller groups of spiral galaxies. Again, they're much younger, and then these these older these eight eight billion year old spherical galaxies, um, or um, you know the the um, spheroid, spheroid shaped um, elliptical galaxies, um, they, they, they're formed, they have these huge populations, you know, it's quite, quite fascinating. Galaxies tend to fall into two groups, the blue cloud and the red, um, or the, yeah, the blue cloud and the red sequence, all right? 
And can you guess which types of galaxies fall into each group? Well, the red galaxies should be the elliptical, and then the blue, the bluer ones should be the, well, spiral galaxies. All right, so spiral, right? Because where, where there's um, lots of ongoing star formation, short-lived stars, and then this is going to be more the elliptical. Okay, so how are the lives of galaxies connected with the history of the universe? Galaxies generally formed when the universe was young and have aged along with the universe. And what patterns do we find among the properties of galaxies? There are three types, spiral, elliptical, and irregular, and gas and dust are more abundant in the spiral and irregular galaxies. All right, so let's talk about the center of galaxies. What does the center of galaxies have in common? Well, what a good question. What evidence is there for black holes at the center of galaxies? Okay, maybe you heard of that, that, that they're that galaxies tend to possess a star-eating black hole at the center? Well, how do we know that, right? Well, one, one thing that we know is we can look at the gravitational behavior of stars around the center, all right? So we can look at infrared light from the center, radio, radio emissions from the center, right? Swirling gas near the center, okay? Orbiting stars, look at their, their orbiting behavior. So stars appear to be orbiting something massive but invisible, a black hole. We talked about this briefly before. And the orbits of the stars suggest a uh, black hole with a mass of about 4 million times the mass of the sun. All right, X-ray flares from the galactic center suggest that the tidal forces um, of a suspected black hole, right, that, and that basically accelerating lots of matter to high velocities, occasionally tearing apart chunks of matter that are about to fall in. Okay? All right, so how, does gal how do galaxies in the foundation of modern cosmology, again, the study of the nature of the universe itself, how are they united? Well, we'll talk about that more in the next chapter. All right. Well, thank you so much for watching this lecture video. I hope it has been interesting and informative.